So you want to learn more about business. Maybe you want to start an engineering company one day, maybe you want to work as a freelance engineer, or maybe you just want to become a more business savvy engineer. Either way, a great way to get there easy and ridiculously cheap is by reading business books and of course applying the knowledge you gain from them. Hi, my name is Anna and I'm a German mechanical engineer based in Sweden. I am also obsessed with learning everything I can about business. I even have a second master's degree in entrepreneurship and I'm still not done with the topic. In fact, I'm working towards starting my own engineering company in a couple of years. So I thought I'd share some of that obsession with you. I've picked five of my all-time favorite business books to each cover one of the five basic areas of any business. All of these books are easy to read and pretty widely known in the business field and they can form the staples of your new business library. So what are the five areas of business? The first area is management. This is where I would put the CEO or the president or the boss of the business. <laughs> and my favorite book for understanding this area is the E-Myth Revisited by Michael E. Gerber. Now, the book has a terrible title and it looks very boring from the outside and from the inside. The author, Michael, is a little bit full of himself, but if we can ignore these minor hiccups, it's a fantastic book. <laughs> If the book was an emoji, I'd give it this one because it's freaking mind blowing. The book is basically about how to run a business and it argues that most specifically small companies are doing it completely wrong. And then it teaches you how to do it instead. I took two key ideas from the book. The first one is that when you start a business, there are three roles sort of competing with each other for your time and attention. The entrepreneur, the manager and the technician. The entrepreneur is the visionary of the business. The manager is the organizer of the business and the technician is the doer of the business. And if you're starting a business as a creative or as an engineer, chances are that you have great technical skills. So the role of the technician will come naturally to you, but you might not know how to run and grow a business. And you need to learn those skills because a business needs all of the three main roles to function. The second key idea of the book is that you should imagine your business as a franchise from day one and then build the first Store, even if you plan on only ever building one store. Because what this does is it forces you to build your business based on systems and not people. And a really cool exercise the book asks you to do is to create an organizational structure for your business as if it was already your goal business. So you write down all the different roles and how they fit into your structure and the responsibilities they have and who they report to. And if it's just yourself right now, you literally put your name into all of the different boxes and then working from the bottom up, you slowly over time replace every single box with other people. If you want to do this exercise, want some inspiration, I actually did this exercise myself. So you can find that on my Twitter. I did that for my YouTube business, <laughs> even though I'm not making any money yet, but I think you cannot do it too early. The second business area is entrepreneurship, which is where you can typically sort the owners or the shareholders of the business as they mostly play the visionary role that I already mentioned. And the book I picked to represent this area is the lead startup by Eric Ries. This book is one of the first business books I ever read and it really resonated with me and still does because of how well its philosophy aligns with the engineering mindset of prototyping and testing. In the Lean Startup this concept is called a minimum viable product or short MVP if you want to sound <laughs> fancy. A minimum viable product is basically the least effort product you can make that still delivers the core value of your product. And the purpose of an MVP is basically to fail early and fast before you have invested a lot of time and effort into your product. And then you iterate again and again and again. So once you have an idea for a product, you build a little, just the bare minimum, and then you immediately show it and sell it to customers and gather their feedback and then build a little more or maybe even completely change the direction if that's what the feedback suggests. And then you sell it to customers again and see if that changes anything about how many want to buy or how much they're willing to pay until you have achieved an actually good product that solves the intended problem. And even then you should still continue to get feedback and iterate. Now there is some criticism to this approach because asking customers what they want isn't always the best way to actually give them what they want because they might not know what it is that they want. The book Zero to One by Peter Thiel really shits on this idea. <laughs> 
By the way, I love business book drama. There's tons of books shitting on other business books and I'm always here for it. So let me know if you want me to make a whole video dissecting this. But anyway, I think a way to mitigate this specific point of criticism is to ask customers to not give feedback with their words, but with their wallet. What I mean by that is that you don't ask customers whether they would buy a product, you ask them to buy a product. The real payments count. I even heard some companies taking this maybe a step too far, I don't know, but they don't have any product. They offer it for sale on a website and there's no product existing. So they basically ask customers to pay for the product and then they say, sorry, <laughs> we don't have any products in stock anymore. And then they return the money. I don't know how ethical that is, but it's definitely a way to implement the strategy of asking customers to give feedback with their wallets, not words. The third business area is marketing and sales, which obviously can be further divided into marketing which is attracting attention and building demand for what you've created and sales which is turning prospective customers into paying customers the absolute best book i ever read about this topic is oversubscribed by Daniel Priestley. What I love so much about this book is that it doesn't see marketing and sales as an isolated business unit, but it actually talks about how marketing and sales can work together with all the other business units like operations and finance to run a successful business. And it gives you incredibly concrete instructions on how to create a hype around your product, how to run your marketing and sales team, and even how the head of marketing and sales should work together with the head of operations and the head of finance. It describes in a lot of detail how you should run your weekly, quarterly and yearly marketing campaigns and which tools you need to give your head of marketing and sales, such as approved marketing images, sales scripts and a terms and conditions agreement. Now, the key idea I took from the book is to market for signals, not sales, which is basically the strategy for becoming oversubscribed and kind of the opposite <laughs> of an MVP. So oversubscribe means that there are more people interested in buying your product than you have products available for sale. And here's how to create that. Now, the reason you want to reach that status of being oversubscribed in the first place is because otherwise your product becomes a commodity. If anyone can always buy it at any time, that they want, then there's never gonna be a hype around your product because people can just get it whenever. So you do want to be oversubscribed. And here's how to do that according to the book. Before you offer your product for sale, you first ask potential customers if they would be interested to buy it. So you go around and make a list of everyone who is interested in buying it and then you go and tell everyone, here's how many people are interested in buying my product. Let's say for example, 700 people. And then you say, you can buy it now, but I only have 150 products available for those 700 people. So obviously there's way more interest than availability. So buy now before it's booked out. According to Priestley, this is the way to achieve a sold out concert or a book or software because it will get people to make a much faster purchasing decision because they see the pressure of there's way less available than there is interest, even though it's only interest. So as we talked about before, getting people to pay is a much stronger signal than just getting them to say that they would be interested or that they want to buy a product. But here's what, where we want the opposite. We want to basically artificially blow up the interest for the product. And with this strategy, you are sort of setting the terms for buying a product, which makes people make much faster purchasing decisions instead of, you know, when they're able to decide over month to month whether they want to go to a concert if they know, okay, it's getting launched then, so many people have already said they're interested and they have to decide right then, do I want it or not? And this makes your product look more appealing and creates a hype around it because we always want what other people want. The fourth business area is finance and admin. The main task of finance is basically basically to bring in enough money to keep going and make your effort worthwhile. And it's often divided into accounts payable and accounts receivable, which is just a fancy way of saying money you owe and money other people owe you. And the admin part means anything related to administration of the business, including HR, legal and IT. But we're gonna focus mostly on the finance part because it's freaking hard to find exciting books about admin work. Even the finance part is already hard enough. So um, the book I picked 
is The Millionaire Fast Lane by MJ DiMarco. Now, I'll admit, crack the code to wealth and live rich for a lifetime gives off finance bro meets alpha male podcaster vibes. And the writing style of the book doesn't exactly help mitigate that. But there are some really interesting lessons in the book and I'm glad I read it. Now, the focus of the book isn't actually business finance, but personal finance or how to get rich. However, the book sees starting a business as the way to get rich, which is where it kind of turns into a business finance book. Similar to the book, The E-Myth Revisited, this book says that a lot of businesses are actually just jobs, but worse, because you have more responsibility and no workplace benefits. And therefore, to make sure you're building a proper wealth generating business, you should make sure to follow five commandments that the book lists. And I think these five commandments are probably the most valuable takeaway from the book. So if you don't want to fight through this very American book, then you're welcome. The first commandment is the commandment of control. So you need to make sure that you can control your business and the success of your business as much as possible. In other words, you should own the land that your business is built on. So for example, you shouldn't be dependent on one specific platform like Amazon or YouTube or a network marketing company. You should either own the platform that you're building on or at least spread out as much as possible so that you have the most control. Second, the commandment of entry. Your business should have a relatively high barrier to entry, something that makes it really hard to imitate what you're doing so that not anyone like your neighbor and your aunt can all join in whenever, which is obviously to reduce competition. Third, the commandment of need. So there must be an actual need for the product you're offering. It can't be just because you are passionate for it is why you're building this business. It must be a real problem that you're solving with it. Fourth, the commandment of time. So your business needs to be independent from your time, meaning that you can find ways to make more money without putting in more time. Otherwise, it's again like a job, just worse. And fifth, the commandment of scale. Your business needs to be easily scalable, which means that you can either easily increase the magnitude or the reach of your business. Increasing magnitude means that you can solve really, really, really big problems. And reach means that you can solve problems for a lot of people. So either you can solve really big problems problems or problems for loads of people or a combination of both. Now, I would add to that that I don't think everything that you do in the beginning of your business needs to be scalable. It can actually be good to spend a lot of time with your first customers and understand their problems and needs as much as possible and maybe even hand serve them in a way that definitely would be scalable. But I 100% agree that there needs to be a potential for scale. So there needs to be a way in which you can later on change the way you're delivering the value you that is scalable. It shouldn't be that every customer you add or additional problem you solve requires a huge amount of effort or that the group of potential customers is really, really small and unable or unwilling to pay for your products. The fifth business area is operations, which means all of the day-to-day -day activities that are needed to run and grow your business, like creating the actual products, delivering the products, doing customer support, all of that. And the book I selected for this business area is called Traction by Gino Wickman. I have never taken as many notes about a book as this one because it's just a masterpiece of actionable instructions for how to set up an operating system to run your business. This operating system is made up of seven main tools that you can use to run your business. And honestly, even if you're not running a business or planning to do so, but maybe you're working for a business, all of these tools are incredibly helpful in systematizing the different tasks you have to do and basically cutting down the effort you need to do those tasks. The first tool you should build according to the book is an accountability chart. And this is very similar to the organizational chart that the book, The E-Myth Revisited, asks you to make. So it's basically an organizational chart that defines all the roles and responsibilities in your company, but it's meant to be used continuously for running your business. The second tool are called rocks, and these are 90 day priorities designed to keep everyone focused on what's most important. The third tool is the meeting pulse 
which is a bunch of recurring weekly, quarterly and yearly meetings with a set structure and agenda that is defined in the book. The fourth tool is the scorecard and that is a weekly report for your business with the 5 to 15 most important numbers that you should be tracking. Number five is the vision traction organizer, which is a tool that defines your core values, core focus, your 10 year target, your marketing strategy, your three year picture and one year plan. Then you have the three step process documenter, which is supposed to capture the blueprint for your business on one page. And the final tool is called everyone has a number and that means exactly what that sounds like. Everyone has one number that they are accountable and responsible for. And this must be a clear, manageable and meaningful number. And really like if you want to either start a business, if you're already running a business, if you want to be a freelancer or if you want to grow into more of a management position, you definitely need to read this book. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> just so like you cannot just summarize as well and there's a ton of exercises that you can do throughout the book even though this is a little bit more advanced so i would not maybe start with this book if you've never read any books about business but once you have read some of the basics like the lean startup or the e-myth revisited then um, definitely get this one if you're interested in more business knowledge, which I hope you are if you watched until now, then you can check out my newsletter called Fresh Engineer Tears, where I do weekly-ish career and business lessons for engineers. Let me know what your favorite business books are and I will be sure to check them out. Also let me know if you want to see a part two of this video with some more advanced business books or maybe a deep dive into one of the business areas of books. I'm still experimenting with bringing in my passion and knowledge in business into this channel so it really helps me out if you let me know what you want to see thank you so much for watching i really appreciate it and i hope to see you in my next video